in your opinion, is China um, and the aspirations of ch China a challenge or maybe even a threat to uh, liberal democracy as we know it? Uh, I think it's a challenge. I'm not sure that it's a threat. Uh, it's really the only non-democratic system out there that has really mastered uh, capitalism and technology and other elements of modernity. It's produced very fast uh, economic growth and um, it you know, seems to have produced a kind of legitimacy for itself because of uh, its track record. Uh, so the real question is, is this a sustainable system uh, and over the next generation, is it going to you know, continue to perform the way it has? But what do we know about uh, China's uh, aspirations when it comes to uh, world dominance? Uh, is China interested in exporting cultural and political values at all? Well, I think it's fundamentally different from the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century because I think uh, the rulers in China are basically interested in stability and, you know, getting rich. Uh, China's relations with other countries are usually driven by commercial uh, uh, motives. I don't think that they are particularly interested in um, exporting their model. I don't think they think that anyone can duplicate their model anywhere else. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a challenge for international relations because anytime you get the emergence of a really big new player, uh, it upsets existing power relationships and, you know, it's, it's potentially uh, uh, destabilizing. So I think that it's probably the, the biggest challenge that the international system faces right now. But is, Ch uh, is China happy about just, uh, you know, buying up the rest of the world? Because that is almost what's happening, isn't it? Well, I think the rest of the world is quite happy to sell to China in that relationship. I think one problem is that there's not just one China. Uh, there's evidence in the last uh, couple of years particularly that the Chinese military, in a sense, regards itself as the guardian of Chinese nationalism. Uh, it doesn't obviously have exactly the same agenda as the civilian leadership within the Communist Party. So you've had several incidents where uh, they seem to be pushing the envelope in terms of being aggressive over the South China Sea and over various territorial disputes with uh, neighbors and that that's driven more by the military than by the party itself. How does the example and success of China fit into your theory about liberal democracy being the endpoint of history? Well, I think the question going forward is what, what the Chinese system represents is uh, high quality authoritarian government. Uh, without checks and balances. And in some sense, um, you know, that kind of a system under good leadership can actually outperform a democracy in the short run because they can make decisions quickly if they're competent, if they've got good technocrats in charge, they can really uh, push forward investment and, you know, do things that a democracy can't do. So that, I think, is a challenge. And right now, you know, the United States is in many ways at the opposite extreme where it's paralyzed, it's got a highly polarized political system, unable to make basic decisions about its long-term fiscal health. Uh, so I think the challenge is really which of these systems going forward, not in the next two or three years, but in the next generation, uh, is going to generate better results. And I still think that an accountable system with checks and balances uh, still is going to be the superior system because the Chinese have had this one problem that they describe as the bad emperor problem that they've never really been able to solve. Meaning, if you've got a good authoritarian government, you're really doing well, but there's absolutely nothing to guarantee that you'll constant, you know, you'll have a constant supply of good leaders. And that's really the problem I think they, they have yet to solve. One thing is then what the, the political elite wants. What about the aspirations of the Chinese people? Uh, how do you see that? What, what, do they do, what do they want? Do they want to be like us in the West? Uh, I don't think that they're so different, really. I think that, you know, they get angry when the government fails to respect their dignity, takes away their property, all of these things. Uh, I think, however, that, you know, the memory of being poor and insecure is very recent. The Cultural Revolution really ended only in the 1970s, and, and the transformation of China has been a near miracle in terms of people's, you know, finding employment, having rising living standards. And I think for many Chinese, you know, that's a, you know, very welcome change. And it was brought about by 
the existing regime, and so I'm not sure that they're, you know, uh, that eager to destabilize it or to move to something, you know, a leap into the unknown where, you know, something like democracy, where they really don't know what what's going to happen at the other end. On the other hand, you also talked about the universality of the wish to live in a society that recognizes human dignity. Mm. Do you think that most Chinese feel that their inherent uh, dignity is, is recognized by the regime? Um, you know, that's a that's a complicated question. I think, uh, in, in in some measure, the demand for dignity rises with rising income and education. Uh, if you're very poor, you know, if you're a, a Chinese peasant that's all of a sudden moved to a city, you've got a job, now you can send money back to your family, you tend not to worry about whether you can participate in politics or, you know, whether you can demonstrate or, 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 or you know, protest uh, uh, your conditions. On the other hand, if you are a college-educated young person, uh, you have high expectations and the system isn't meeting that, and you're on the internet and you talk to your friends and you know you have a basic uh, kind of security in life, I think that kind of individual is potentially much more dangerous to a regime. And so when you say the Chinese people, I think you really need to distinguish. And I think you know the leading edge of most revolutions is caused by middle class, you know, better educated people that really don't have a place in the system. Right now they do, but in another generation they may not. But do you think then that, that we could see uh, at, at some time uh, a revolution or insurgence in, in China like we've seen in, in the Middle East now? Well, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon because China's just doing too well at, at this point. Uh, I think that the question you have to ask is in, you know, a few years if the economic model falters, and it, it has to falter. I mean, no country this large can continue to grow at 10% indefinitely. So that's going to slow down and the job machine will slow down. Uh, and at that point, uh, you know, if they have a really big economic setback or even a Japanese style uh, uh, landing where, you know, they have very sluggish growth for an extended period of time, I think that's the point at which you have to, you know, look for signs of social instability. But it's actually somewhat of a danger to the regime that they are educating so many people that the, 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 the education standard is, is, is so high in China. Or yeah, well, that's, that's right. I mean, in, in many respects, that's where they're doing well because they've got all the engineers and you know, um, uh, uh, managers that can actually run a modern economy. But uh, it's very easy for that to get out of kilter. And right now, there's strong demand for low-skill labor, but there's not sufficient demand for the college educated. And that that's a politically, you know, a potentially dangerous situation. Let's view this uh, challenge from China from another perspective. Uh, an autocratic political system like China makes it uh, easier to make complex and uh, unpopular decisions. Um, my question is, if we in the West want to stay uh, competitive in a globalized world, could we be sort of forced to uh, comp compromise some of our political ideals to uh, simply follow up with China? Uh, I seriously doubt that we're going to change the institutional rules of our democracies to make ourselves look more like China. I, I just can't really conceive of that happening. I think the real question is, in the context of a well-institutionalized democracy, are we going to be able to achieve political consensus uh, on the painful steps necessary to keep you know, the society uh, sustainable? Uh, I think every Western democracy uh, in, in fact, it's not just every Western democracy, every developed country uh, faces a need to renegotiate many elements of its existing social contract because the existing welfare states were created in a time when people didn't live as long, uh, when birth rates were higher, uh, and therefore the ability to actually sustain these entitlements going ahead into the future uh, is going to be very great. And then you get further problems related to immigration. You need immigration in order to sustain populations, but then that produces, you know, political backlash. And so I think really the question is, uh, in the context of a democratic system, are you going to be able to um, overcome, you know, conflicts created by, you know, these painful decisions that will, you know, will lie in the future? Uh, that's really the challenge. And I think oftentimes uh, 
the track record of democracy isn't that great. A lot of times it really requires an external shock or a big crisis uh, uh, you know, to f finally convince people uh, to make these decisions. And at that point, the decision is more costly and more painful uh, and so forth. You talked about the necessity of a new social contract. What should that new social contract be like? What's the content of it? Well, it differs in every country because every country's fiscal situation is, uh, is different. Japan, of all developed countries, is the first to experience this because it has the largest uh, public debt. Uh, it has the most rapidly aging uh, population. And what it means is that you know, many fewer workers are going to support many more uh, retired people uh, in, in, in the near future. And so that means some combination of higher taxes, reduced benefits, uh, and the like, and uh, something that the United States will face, and it's something that most European countries will face because of, um, you know, because of the same demographic uh, uh, pressure. Talking about the educational system, it seems to me that, uh, at least in Denmark, a lot of politicians and uh, and uh, ed educational researchers, they look to uh, China and Singapore and countries like that mm -hmm. to see what they are doing there. Uh, so maybe not to emulate their system, but to, to see what, what are they doing right. What, what does that tell you about the, the, the sort of educational culture impact of China on the West? Well, you know, I'm not so sure that these countries are the best ones to emulate in terms of education. Uh, because they tend to do well in math and science, and obviously that's you know that's important. But you know what you really need uh, in order to compete in the you know contemporary world is innovation and you know creativity, and that's something that I don't think the you know any of these Asian systems have really been able to you know to crack. I mean this willingness to challenge authority, to be able to think for yourself, to come up with new paradigms. That's something that really is not prized in, in a Asian educational systems. Rather, it's deference to authority. You know, you just learn by the, by the book. And, you know, some things you can learn that way. But other things, you know, I think require greater independence of mind. Um, one thing that is not clear to me is I don't think the Chinese have actually created anything new in terms of technology, you know, basic science. Uh, they're getting up to the point, they're catching up, and they're getting up to the point where they're going to need to do that. And it's a real question whether their educational system is preparing people that can make that next leap you know, into the future. So we'll, you know, we'll have to see. I'm not saying that I know that this not, it's not going to happen, but it's not demonstrated to me yet that their educational system can really accomplish this. Do you think in the future that, uh, that we will become more like the Chinese, or will the Chinese become more like us? You know, if I had to guess, I, I would, I, I really suspect that the Chinese are going to become more like us because I do think that higher levels of education and contact with the outside world does produce a uh, certain convergence in, you know, in, in culture and in, in the way people uh, think. Um, and I think in things like the willingness to question authority and, 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 and the like, uh, I really cannot see Westerners adopting Chinese attitudes towards authority that, you know, somehow we're going to go back to, you know, this highly deferential, very hierarchical kind of uh, system. I can, however, see a lot of Chinese young people, you know, uh, getting their education in the West and actually adopting, you know, a lot of uh, Western practices, uh, even as they begin to, you know, even as they realize that their system has got a lot of strengths that, you know, that need to be protected. So you don't think that in 2050 there will be a Chinese way of life that we will all be trying to emulate here in the West? I think that there will be aspects of China. You know, for example, in the United States, uh, there's a book uh, by Amy Chua that was published about Chinese mothers uh, and the way that they, you know, force their kids to, you know, work and study and so forth. And I think probably there's a lot of American mothers that are now emulating, you know, that kind of practice, but uh, as a as a whole, um, I don't think that the overall Chinese way of life, particularly in the realm of politics, is something that Westerners are, are ever likely to emulate. Because I think there's just too much, you know, individualism and, and belief in the autonomy of the individual in, in Western civilization for that to be the case.